Hey everyone, thanks for tuning into this video. My name is Nate Jones, and today I'm going to be talking to you about one of my favorite movie genres, dystopias. Now in this video, I'm going to break down some of the historical events that influence the genre, as well as discuss some of my favorite dystopian films. But before we get into that, let's quickly touch on the history of the idea of the word dystopia. Now, to really understand what a dystopia is, you need to know about its opposite, the word utopia, which was first discussed by Sir Thomas More in 1516. The word utopia comes from the Greek words utopis and eutopis, which literally mean no place and good place. Now, More argued that such a good and perfect world hadn't been seen by humans, and therefore it couldn't exist. The first actual example of the word dystopia being used came in 1868 by John Stuart Mill in a speech that he gave to the British House of Commons. Some people believe that the first dystopian writing was actually before the word was even uttered, in Mary Shelley's book, The Last Man, published in 1826. It wasn't until over 50 years after Mill's speech to the British House of Commons that the word started to be popularized by authors. It started to gain popularity after Evgeny Zamyatin published his story, We, in 1921. His story went on to influence some of the most prolific dystopian stories ever told, including George Orwell's 1984 and Aldous Huxley's A Brave New World. Since then, the genre has gained a lot of popularity and success within pop culture and the film world. The first dystopian film ever made was the German film Metropolis, created by Fritz Lang in 1927. The film focuses heavily on class inequality and economic despair, which makes a lot of sense if you know what was going on in German history at that time. After World War I, the German economy was in shambles due to the hyperinflation that followed the war. The hyperinflation had huge impacts on the German economy and took a huge toll on its middle and lower class citizens. At that time, the German mark became all but useless, and many citizens actually took to burning their money for warmth instead of what it was actually supposed to be used for. This time in German history was also marked with political unrest and drastic changes in the government, so it makes sense that Lang conceived Metropolis after living through such a crazy time. In the 1930s, we saw the creation of the British propaganda piece, Things to Come, released in 1936. In the film, a fictional, futuristic British city is attacked via air raid by an unnamed foe from the east. Now, if you know anything about geography, you'll know that one of the countries to the east of England is Germany. So, clearly film creator H.G. Wells still feared a possible German attack after World War I, and it greatly influenced his film. Seems a little on the nose, but again, this film was just as much a propaganda piece as it was a narrative film. The title is also ironic because of the impending world war that would follow starting in 1939. The 40s. Not really much going on in the way of dystopian films in the 40s, actually. Probably because people were more worried about, you know, Hitler, the rise of fascism, Nazis, and the world war that was going on and basically destroying all of Europe. The 50s, however, once again saw the genre pick up steam in a very different way. In 1959, the film On the Beach was released. In this film, surviving members of humanity try to live out their last blissful days in Australia after a nuclear war destroyed the rest of the world. While this is considered one of the more positive films in the genre, it shows us a new fear on the mind of filmmakers. After the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, the world had seen a new type of evil. We were now aware of the horrors that humans could cause on a massive scale. Myself and many people who study this genre believe that the dropping of the bombs had a huge impact on the genre and also changed the films that would follow in the years to come. After the dropping of the bombs, people were more concerned about what happens after the nuclear fallout. How does humanity survive after a world has been plagued by nuclear war? This idea is something that does not go away and really influences the coming generations of dystopian films. In the 60s, the world was once again struck by fear surrounding the Korean War. The world has also seen the first man-made object touch down on the moon with the Soviet Union's Luna 2. Both these ideas influenced the films of this era. In the French film La Jete, we see a post-World War III society living under Paris where a world has become poisoned by nuclear fallout. Films like Alphaville and Planet of the Apes that were also released at this time focus on space travel as humans were now looking towards the stars for inspirations for their stories. The 70s gave us some of the most prolific films in the genre, including Soylent Green, Soylent Green is people! A Clockwork Orange, which is a personal favorite of mine, Mad Max, The Omega Man, and THX 1138. The rise of the hippie counterculture in the 60s and 70s and the fear of growing environmental disasters and the U.S. recession from 1973 to 1975 greatly impacted the genre. 
Soil and Green focuses on overpopulation and resource shortages. Mad Max focuses on a world destroyed by war where the most valuable resource is oil. This makes a lot of sense considering the state of the world. The baby boomers were growing up, population was growing, and the struggle between the U.S. and Soviet forces in the Middle East over oil can be seen throughout this decade's films. The 80s was a great time for the dystopian genre. We saw a boom in the action movies, and that was felt in dystopian films as well, through films like Escape from New York, released in 1981. Dystopian action films like Escape from New York and Robocop were probably born out of fears surrounding mass incarceration, the war on drugs, and the privatization of police and prison forces. The 80s was also a great time for technological advancements in the movie industry, which made it possible to produce new and amazingly technologically advanced worlds. That's why we see the birth of films like Brazil, Akira, <laughs> Ridley Scott's famous Blade Runner, which is considered by many the cornerstone of dystopian films. Orwell's 1984 also finally got its movie creation in this era, and it turned out okay. The 90s were also a good time for dystopian films. It gave us movies like The Twelve Monkeys, Total Recall, and of course, The Matrix. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Offering is the truth, nothing more. Now, The Matrix is another one of those films regarded as the best in the genre, and it touches on a lot of big fears that were bubbling up at the time. In The Matrix, humans are used as batteries for their machine overlords who have taken over the world after some cataclysmic event caused by humans. Now, in the film, it's not specifically said what happened to cause all of this, but it's clear that humans screwed up and now our machine overlords have, you know, taken over. This is the world as it exists today. What is the Matrix? Control. The Matrix is a computer-generated dream world built to keep us under control in order to change a human being into this. The Wachowskis made an amazing film, and The Matrix was released at the perfect time. The home computer was becoming almost a necessity, and the growing fears around Y2K certainly led to the popularity of this film where machines rise up and take control of the world. 
At the turn of the century, the 2000s, we get some great films like Battle Royale, a violent thrill ride where kids are forced to fight for the amusement of adults. Battle Royale is set in a dystopian version of Japan where a totalitarian government captures a random class of ninth graders and forces them to compete in a fight to the death. Each student is given a bag of supplies that contains one weapon. Some weapons are good, like guns, and some are bad, like pot lids. Oof, not good. You get a weapon, maybe? This, this is what I'm supposed to kill people with? Are you serious? The students are given three days to kill all of their peers. If more than one person is alive at the end of the three days, the bomb collars that they are outfitted with will explode, killing them all instantly. It's brutal. Now, many critics of the genre argue that The Hunger Games straight up riffed off this movie. I can't really talk about Battle Royale without making some obvious comparisons to The Hunger Games. The Hunger Games, before Hunger Games, if it was run by the Japanese... The person who wrote The Hunger Games definitely blatantly stole the majority of what happened in that movie. I think the Japanese did this film a fuckload better. We also saw V for Vendetta get its film debut as well as another one of my personal favorites, Idiocracy, which is a hilarious commentary on the state of the world at the time and the dumbing down of society. Evolution does not necessarily reward intelligence. With no natural predators to thin the herd, it began to simply reward those who reproduced the most and left the intelligent to become an endangered species. Having kids is such an important decision. We're just waiting for the right time. It's not something you want to rush into, obviously. No way. <laughs> oh shit, I'm pregnant again! I got too many damn kids! Thought you was on the pill or some shit! Hell no! I must have been thinking of Brittany. Brittany? No, you can't! There's no way we could have a child now. Mm -hmm. Not with the market the way it is, no. Oh, God, no. That just wouldn't make any sense. Come on over here, bitch! He don't care about you! Yeah, well there must be something he likes over here! Well, we finally decided to have children, and I'm not pointing fingers, but it's not going well. And this is helping. So. I'm just saying that before I have in vitro, maybe you should be willing uh, to... It's always me, right? Well, it's not my sperm count. <laughs> yeah! I'm gonna fuck all of you! That's my boy! <laughs> Cleavon is lucky to be alive. He attempted to jump a jet ski from a lake into a swimming pool and impaled his crotch on an iron gate. But thanks to recent advances in stem cell research and the fine work of doctors Krensky and Altshuler, Cleavon should regain full reproductive function. Your hands off my junk! Unfortunately, Trevor passed away from a heart attack while masturbating to produce sperm for artificial insemination. But I have some eggs frozen. So just as soon as the right guy comes along, you know. And so it went for generations, although few, if any, seem to notice. In the 2000s, films were greatly influenced by advances in technology, the growth of the young adult story, and many believe that the 9-11 attacks and the war on terror around the world or why we see such an influx in the early 2000s in these type of dystopian movies. Now our last decade that we're going to touch on, the 2010s, was the boom of the YA or young adult story. Many believe that the success of the Hunger Games franchise was highly impactful on the movie industry and caused films like the Divergent series, The Giver, Ready Player One, all to get their time on the big screen. But why do we see such a switch from popular dystopian stories to focus on younger characters? Many experts think that's in part with the Harry Potter series. The kids that grew up reading the Harry Potter series were drawn to these type of young adult dystopian stories. If you look at Harry Potter, the subject matter is actually pretty dark. You have death, consequences, difficult moral and ethical choices, and it's all done by kids. Kids are living in this fantastical world, sure, but they're also making difficult decisions that impact all of those around them. Now, these type of things at least stuck with the audience subconsciously. And young people to this day love to see people like them triumph or revolt over evil forces. The 2010s also gave us films like The Purge, which, while it may not be highbrow cinema, it still rakes in the dollars and shows us one thing, violent cells. We all know violent video games, TV, and movies have become more prevalent over the last few decades, and that's why The Purge is so popular. People love the blood and gore. They want to see that violence acted out on the big screen. Oh, no. 
We also got movies like Snowpiercer, which touch on environmental issues that are becoming more and more prevalent in today's society. Dystopian films almost always follow a similar formula. There's a hero who doesn't really want to be part of the resistance or fight, and they're forced into conflict reluctantly by unforeseen forces. They then accept their role and usually triumph over the villain or villainous group at the end. But the best dystopian films all seem to touch on the same tropes. The best ones seem to come from coming-of-age stories that focus on revolution, survival, different types of living situations, and difficult moral and ethical dilemmas. Before I leave you all, I want to give you a list of my top five favorite dystopian films or franchises, and also a few underrated gems you should check out if you're looking for more films to watch in this genre. Now my number five on this list is the Mad Max series, but specifically the most recent version of the series, Mad Max Fury Road. In this movie, we see Tom Hardy battle evil forces in a dystopian wasteland. This is an action-packed film with great fight and chase scenes, most of which were achieved through practical effects. I highly recommend this movie to anyone who likes a fast-paced and exciting film. And I also recommend checking out how they made the movie in the behind the scenes section. Number four is Stanley Kubrick's classic A Clockwork Orange. Now, I hate to be this guy when talking about movies, but the book is a lot better. Sorry, it just is. It's one of my favorite books of all time. But that's saying a lot because I also love this movie, and it's one of my favorite movies. I could personally watch Alex and his droogs get high at the Korokova milk bar and do a little bit of the ultraviolence forever. I even have my shirt. Got Maloko. My third favorite dystopian film comes from my current favorite director, Bong Joon-ho, and that's his 2013 masterpiece, Snowpiercer. Some may recognize this title from the new show of the same name on TNT. However, the film was what introduced a lot of Western audiences to the genius that is Bong Joon-ho. In Bong Joon-ho's 2013 Snowpiercer, the last of humanity is aboard a giant train that circles the world once a year. And they have to do this because of an environmental disaster, once again caused by humans. This film touches on a lot of environmental issues that are very prevalent today. I could go on for hours about this film and about Bong Joon-ho in general. I mean, I am wearing his uh, Parasite Victory shirt. So, anyone out there who wants a good dystopian film from Bong Joon-ho, check out Snowpiercer. And also check out Parasite. It was the best film in 2019, so everyone should watch it. My number two film on this list is the 1988 anime Akira, directed by Katsushiro Otomo, who also wrote the manga of the story. Akira is simply beautiful. Neo Tokyo is one of the coolest cities I've ever had the pleasure to get lost in, and the film is considered a landmark for not only the animated genre, but also dystopian films. I highly recommend checking out Akira, especially if you're a fan of animated features, because it is a beauty. And finally, my number one on this list is the Blade Runner series. Both Ridley Scott's original film from 1982 and its sequel Blade Runner 2049 from Denis Villeneuve are the definition of eye candy, with a complex story and futuristic world to boot. The Blade Runner franchise is everything we want in a dystopian story. Beautiful, fantastic, futuristic worlds filled with complex and difficult themes and decisions for the main characters to make. Both films also sport a kick-ass cast, and 2049 has my favorite cinematographer attached to it in Roger Deakins. I can't recommend both films highly enough. If you watch the first one, though, make sure to pick the director's cut, because it adds a lot of depth to the original story and helps set up the sequel. Some other great films in the genre to check out are Children of Men, The Lobster, The Platform, and the animated version of Ghost in the Shell. Make sure it's the animated version, though. It's much better, trust me. You could also throw in Terminator on this list. I'll be back. But I kind of left it off because it's more about giant killer robots coming back from the dystopic future to fix their dystopic future. But, I mean, T2 is an all-time classic, so what the hell. Well... I hope for those of you who've watched, you've enjoyed this video. Thanks for taking the time to watch it. And please reach out to me, comment, let me know what your favorite dystopian films are and why you think they're so great. Thank you. Bye.